Fifth grade was a special time at Dean Road Elementary School. As a fifth grader, you were one of the oldest children in the building, which came with a certain status in the pickup line and on the playground. By that point, you knew most of the teachers and staff, and so you almost felt like you owned the place. But most importantly, fifth grade was special because you got to rotate classes. Instead of staying in the same classroom all day with one teacher who taught all the subject, you got to go to different classes with different teachers for English and math and history. And sure, all these classes were all on the same hallway, but the freedom and the responsibility of rotating classes could not be denied. It was, we all felt, a preparatory step toward middle school and the all-important signifier of adolescence, the locker. Yes, fifth grade was a special time at Dean Road Elementary School, and it impressed on my memory for many reasons. But my fifth grade year was particularly significant because I was in fifth grade on September 11th, 2001. We were on a field trip at the Jan Dempsey Art Center, completing some sort of art scavenger hunt. And I remember that our teachers looked upset, but initially I didn't think much of that. I assumed that someone had left their lunch or that the bus was running late. Those were the sorts of disasters that my fifth grade mind could come up with. It was when we returned to Dean Road Elementary School that I knew that something was deeply wrong. Almost everyone was getting picked up early and some of the teachers were crying. And all they said to us was that something bad had happened and that our parents would tell us about it later. My parents did. They told me what they knew at the time that two planes had hit the, tw the Twin Towers in New York City. Towers they told me that I had been in as a little baby. That was the first trip they took with me as an infant. Apparently I had been on the observation deck of the World Trade Center in my mother's arms. They told me that another plane hit a building called the Pentagon and that another had crashed in a field. They didn't want me or my sister to see the images or the video footage feeling that it was too traumatic for our age. But of course they couldn't keep me from seeing them as the images filled newspapers and television screens for days and weeks afterwards. And it was traumatic, right? Not just for me, but for all of us who saw them. Many of those images were on my mind this week as yesterday marked the 20th anniversary of 9-11. I've lived two thirds of my life since that day, all of my adolescence and all of my adulthood. So it's difficult to fully understand how that day and everything that has come afterward has impacted me as a person, how it's impacted my understanding of the country that I live in, of the world that I'm a part of. I read an article this week that interviewed teenagers, all of whom were born after September 11th, 2001, about the ways in which they've been taught about that day and everything that came afterwards. The journalists spoke to students across the globe, New York City, Russia, Iraq, Pakistan, France, Australia, South Korea. None of them have their own memories of that day. They only have what they have been taught, both formally and informally. 
As one might guess, their educations on 9-11 differ depending on their geopolitical position and location. But all of them, all of them voiced a desire to know more and to be taught with more nuance, to be trusted with a deeper understanding. They all named that they know it's a difficult topic to teach, but then each of them rightly pointed out that it continues to shape their existence. And again and again, these young people said that they want to understand the legacy of that day so that their generation can learn from it and know how to interact with their global neighbors. Not many of you should become teachers, my siblings, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. The author of James understands teaching as a sacred role. For all of you who are teachers here, you know that you have a sacred role. He names up front that maybe not everyone should do it. Not everyone should hold the power that comes with a formal teaching career. And he knows that teachers are often judged. And if you've ever been a teacher, I'm sure you have been judged and judged harshly. Now, on the one hand, this seems right. We should have high standards for those who are responsible for shaping minds. On the other hand, and especially in light of the teaching conditions for so many in the United States, it seems unfair. As we're at the start of another school year, my mind, and I'll be honest, some of my anger goes to the near impossible predicament we have put so many of our teachers in. We demand so much and we offer so little to the ones with this sacred duty. Yet James' point is worth considering as harsh as it may be. And I wonder if some of those teenage students would echo his concern for they know, as James knows, that what one is taught impacts how one lives. We can't be sure, but some commentators believe that James is writing to a particular teacher or a particular group of teachers in this passage. James is mad. James is mad because someone in the Christian community has been teaching bad theology. Someone has inaccurately taught the people that it's okay to disregard the poor and that Faith doesn't need to be accompanied by action. And so if you heard some anger in today's texts, that's on purpose. James is angry because poor teaching leads to poor action. Poor teaching can lead to a Christian life that looks nothing like Christ. So James has to intervene and teach the people to honor and give dignity to the poor and to teach them that one's inner faith life must be accompanied by just works. And James indicts anyone who would teach the congregation otherwise. There are many congregations in my hometown of Auburn, Alabama, home to Dean Road Elementary School and the Jan Dempsey Art Center. Auburn is in the Bible Belt, and most people go to church on Sundays and on Wednesdays and sometimes also on Thursdays and Saturdays. Most people, if asked, would call themselves a Christian. And I remember sometime in that same fifth grade year, my mom coming home furious. She'd heard that a white woman ran her full grocery cart into a Muslim woman at the Kroger. This Islamophobic act was one of the hundreds and hundreds that occurred in the aftermath of 9-11. Now, I don't know for sure, 
But given the makeup of Auburn, Alabama, that white woman was probably a Christian. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. This passage, it's about the power of the tongue, the power of words. And James gives us many metaphors to think about this. The tongue as a horse, a ship, a fire, all of which are powerful. These things, they give us the ability to travel, to navigate, to spark, and to warm. But they also bring danger and harm. James would reject the primary school adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We all know this, right? Words can hurt. Words do hurt. Words, when unbridled, can lead to immense and irreparable harm. Again, I don't know this for sure, but I imagine that the Christian woman in my hometown did not typically go about hitting people with her grocery cart. She was not randomly filled with a hatred so strong that she caused the shocking harm to another person. She learned it somewhere. Whether it was a pulpit or a news channel or a friend or a family member or a politician, someone or likely multiple someones taught and cultivated a fear and hatred of the other. I was only in fifth grade, but I remember this. I remember the rhetoric around Islam and frankly, around anyone whose appearance suggested a connection to the Middle East. No one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord our God and with it, we curse those who are made in God's image. James writing is as poignant today as it was 20 years ago, as it was when he wrote it, as it was at any point in human history when we have used words to belittle and dehumanize others. It has been 20 years since that grocery cart in that Kroger, but only six months since a Vietnamese man was punched in my neighborhood while going on a walk. Part of the anti-Asian violence that we've seen rise in the past year. It has been 20 years since 9-11, but only nine months since white supremacists stormed the US Capitol. Many in the name of Jesus. Out of the same mouth, siblings and sisters and brothers, this ought not to be so. You see, our mouths are such powerful instruments. This is one of the first things I learned when studying theater and studying politics and studying theology. Our mouths are powerful instruments. And that's not a bad thing. Indeed, it is such a gift. It's one of the first gifts that God gave us. The ability to communicate with one another and to describe the world around us. The ability to make meaning out of what is happening in our lives. But we have to use that gift carefully and intentionally. We are called to wise speech, to speech that uplifts and encourages, to speech that loves and tells the good news, to speech that stands with the poor and the downtrodden, to speech that advocates for justice and righteousness. We are called to wise speech, speech that asks for forgiveness. That is another wonderful gift of God. I'm so grateful for that. The ability to say, I am sorry. To apologize when our words have hurt our neighbor, our friend, our fellow congregant, our family member, even when our words hurt people whose names we don't know, but whose culture we've disparaged. For all of us make many mistakes, says James. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect able to keep the whole body in check. Being wise doesn't mean perfection. That's not possible. It means apologizing for damage we have done and seeking to repair and restore. And James leaves us with an image of that restoration. 
He describes a pool of water with a spring that is pouring forth. And he asks, does the same spring hold both fresh and brackish water? Does the same mouth praise God and curse her children? None of us is perfect. But we do know that what we say and how we act, it matters. For in the end, we're all teacher and student both. We each have a story to tell, something to teach everyone around us, and we have so many stories to hear. Imagine how the last 20 years might have been different if those with powerful speech had followed James' advice and blessed the Lord our God instead of cursing those who are made in God's image. Or the last 100 years, or the last two millennia for that matter. Now imagine what the next 20 years will hold. Because in many ways, we're on a precipice with so many divisions and cracks between us. Imagine what the next 20 years might bring if we live into them with mutual learning, if we listen deeply to that heartbeat we all share, the one that is beating at the center of all creation. Each one of us has the capacity to be fresh water. And with each drop that leaves our mouths, we can dilute the brackish discourse into something that is alive with love and with fellowship. So dear ones, my prayer is that we will be wise and that we will be brave, that we will speak into the world with love on our tongues, both praising God and blessing those who are made in her image. Amen. Thank you.